Yeah, so um, we've got half an hour for, for discussion and for questions. So if I just start off by uh, introducing uh, Roger Crisp and Rebecca Roach. Roger is um, uh, part of the Hero Centre and Rebecca Roach has kindly joined us from Royal Holloway this morning. Um, we're, we're making an assumption that you've already listened to the Microaggression podcast by uh, Dave Edmonds and Regina Rini. Um, if you haven't, uh, you can find it on the event webpage. So please do go and have a listen afterwards and hopefully things will make a bit more sense. Um, if you want to ask any questions as we're going along, you can either use the chat function um, or the Q&A function, which are both at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try and take questions as we're going along. Um, and obviously there'll be a chance at the end to ask some questions as well, if you want to. So thank you very much for joining us this morning, everybody. And uh, take it away, Roger and Rebecca. Thanks very much, Liz. Rebecca, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I, I can't. I can't see any participants. Is that? Um, just want to make sure we're all. Uh, that is unfortunately absolutely right. This is a webinar, okay. so uh, your face is being beamed largely into everybody else's computer, but you can't see them. Oh right. Okay. Hi, um, everyone. Yeah, I thought this was this was a really really interesting. Um, episode I thought that um, Professor Rini draws some sort of really interesting distinctions between things like um, microaggression itself versus how we communicate online which seems to be you know it, it, it seems to be that this uh, accusations of microaggression is quite, is quite common online um, and also the sort of general issue of uh, you know, sort of one person's individual microaggression might not itself do much damage, but it's the it's the combination. And then, you know, Professor Rini compares that to, you know, sort of going out for a drive in your car might not do much to um, to contribute to global warming, but sort of viewed as a practice that lots of people are engaging in. Um, it's something that that we should take seriously. Um, so yeah, I thought this was um, one um, one particularly, I suppose my overriding thought on um, after hearing this episode was, this sounds like uh, an issue that we should all take seriously and there are sort of, we can all reflect on how we each behave, but also given the sort of problem it is, um, I ended up think, wondering, you know, sort of, is some sort of central intervention by governments appropriate here? Uh, given that, you know, in sort of other similar problems like climate change, we look not only to individuals to modify their behaviour, but we also expect some guidance from uh, the government. Mm. Yeah, I completely go along with that, Rebecca. Um, and I think you're quite right. It's something you need to take seriously. And... One thought I had was how philosophers should take it seriously. So, you know, as you know, standardly in philosophy, philosophers get together and they say, you know, what is such and such? You know, what is personal identity or what is justice or what is freedom or whatever? Mm. And there's a kind of problem with that, which is that you, you might end up with people kind of talking past one another to some extent. Mm it may turn into what's really a verbal dispute. So it could be that, you know, you and I and Regina and Dave sit down and talk about what microaggressions are and we'll each have our own particular view of what it is. But what we could do, we could, we could sit there for ages saying, well, what are they really? Mm. It's, to me, it's an open question whether that, that makes sense, that question. Couldn't we just say, Look, we've got different conceptions of uh, what microaggressions are. We could we could use several of them. We could understand them in various ways. So as I understand it from the podcast, the person who invented it was making a general point about sort of collective action in the context of sport. So mm -hmm. individual people in a team may not be aggressive, but the team can be aggressive. Um, and that seems to make perfect sense. But there was no sort of... As far as I could tell, when, when the concept was invented, there was no idea of uh, any kind of moral background to it. But we might now want to say, well, we want, we're going to, uh, as, as it's now used, I think there is an assumption that uh, 
a microaggression is something that takes place within a moral context. And then the question would be, um, how should we take it seriously? Well, what we might do is come up with what we think is the most helpful definition to take forward. What's the problem with them? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, um, this, is, uh, this is a sort of issue that we want some rigor brought to. Yeah. Um, but it's also something that uh, we want we want to make a practical difference so it would be a shame if it became one of those issues that, that you know things like sort of personal identity where you sort of think well philosophers have, haven't agreed they've been discussing this for centuries and nobody's really any closer to an answer so we don't you know given the importance of something like this um and the fact that you know it sort of contributes to injustice and yeah. inequality um, we can't afford for it to be that sort of issue right that um, philosophers talk about and disagree about for possibly centuries um, we want some sort of end result um, and so I'm wondering then um, and I wonder what you think of this uh, whether there is some compromise to be struck between rigor and just making a difference that perhaps we don't make but perhaps we don't need a, a sort of absolutely precise definition. We need a working definition. And, you know, it could be something that's updated and yeah. honed on the I would, line. I think I would agree with that. And it may be that by working through it and thinking about what matters, we, we come up with a clearer account of what it is. And I, I must say, I would be inclined to go for a more capacious definition than... The one that Regina was going for. So for example, I think I understood her to be saying that you commit a microaggression only when you, you don't have to know you're doing it, mm. but the person who's, you know, the object of it has to realise what's going on. I, myself, I, I think I'd prefer not to do that because it seems to me what we're talking about is a set of types of activity which constitute a certain kind of oppression. Hmm. And the question is, well, does the oppression really happen? Yes, it does. It doesn't really matter too much whether the individual people in the group that are oppressed realize that it's happening. Hmm. For it hmm. to be something we want to take seriously. Right, yes. Um, I'm reminded of the... Um... Uh, the literature on adaptive preferences where you know yeah. sort of the the oppressed group might not notice and that might itself be part of the problem you know <clears throat> that they're just sort of habituated to being i guess othered in a particular way you know they might notice that people respond differently to them than to other people but they they might accept it um i think that's right and I mean, I suppose one question would be, you know, what counts as a harm? So, mm -hmm. for example, if I commit a microaggression and the other person doesn't realise, um, mm. have I harmed them? I mean, if, <clears throat> if harm depends just on your suffering in some way, then I suppose maybe you, you, you haven't been harmed. But I think many people would extend it to, to something broader than that. Mm. And that also, I think, raises questions about the analogy with climate change. So like you, I thought that was a very interesting analogy. And I think it works to a certain extent. I mean, we're talking about a bunch of things which, you know, taken individually wouldn't be problematic if they were, as it were, out of the context that we find them in. But you add them all up and it turns into something really bad. Mm. I think there is a disanalogy, though, which is that as far as I can see, in the case of climate change, unless you're Joe Biden or Greta Thunberg or somebody like that, what you do really isn't going to make any difference uh, to whether all the bad consequences occur. Mm. Um, whereas in the case of a microaggression, there is a very good chance you, you are going to uh, cause harm. Right. Yes, that's that's a really good point. Yes. That's true. So just sort of one misplaced, where are you really from? Or, you know, so yeah. what's your real name itself causes harm in a way that uh, taking a car for a half a mile journey 
actually doesn't. No, absolutely. Mm. And that's, yeah, that that's one of the horrible aspects of climate change. Right. No, no individual is really responsible for it. There's mm. nothing you can do about it. Mm. Right. Yeah, that's great. And that, that sort of, um, I suppose, shed some light on the, the issue that I mentioned near the start, which was, you know, with climate change, we expect governments to take the lead because yeah. it's that big a problem. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, sort of listening to the, the podcast, I was thinking, well, you know, shouldn't shouldn't we be looking to governments to take the lead here? But but given that, um, you know, sort of as you say, the individual, in the case of microaggression, individuals are responsible in the way that they're perhaps not in the climate change case, that, that perhaps we can afford for that not to happen. I guess I'm sort of implicitly favouring as hands off a approach by governments as possible. Yeah. Because, you know, these things can backfire, can't they? Uh, absolutely. Um, that's a nice contrast. So climate change is more of a political issue um because it involves government whereas mm. in the case of microaggression the personal becomes political because you've it's really i think i think when people talk about microaggression what they're often doing is is challenging you to think about your own behavior mm. and i think one of the problems is that people are not inclined to do that um right and so in that respect, I think I can understand why somebody like Regina is happy to rely on what she called proleptic blame, where, you know, yeah. some, somebody says something that clearly is a kind of microaggression, but they, they don't realise it. So you say to them, well, do you realise you've done this? Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, OK, well, I'm not going to blame you, but if you do it again, I will. Mm. Seems to me, what one could say is... Um, yeah, I mean, if we were in the 1950s or something, it might make sense for you to say that. But given that we know so much more about microaggressions and what they consist in, everybody really ought to be thinking about their own behaviour. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and yeah, changing the proleptic brain. Sorry. And changing it as appropriate. Yeah. Um, so I just, I, I realize I'm in silhouette. I just have a problem with lighting in this. I'm just going to shine this in my face. So at least I'm not some gloomy, sinister figure. Um, yes, I thought the, I, I was thinking about that, the, the proleptic blame issue. And so I suppose, you know, sort of the idea there is that it's a gentle way to approach people who, with good intentions, commit microaggressions that you can make them aware of their behavior in a gentle way without accusing them um and i found myself wondering whether that is how possible is that really um because i think you know even if you're not actually um aggressively accusing somebody of something um taking the sort of i don't know if you realize you did this um i'm going to forgive you this time but but next time isn't that likely to seem a little patronizing and you know sort of i can imagine somebody thinking well who are you to to judge to judge me you know i don't i don't have an answer here i'm just sort of wondering whether the proleptic blame approach serves the purpose that regina wants it to because it seems to be that this is a way to that we can avoid accusing people and i thought well yes technically but is the the average person who hasn't read Bernard Williams going to recognise that this is a more respectful, gentle way of approaching them. Yeah, that is a very nice point. I mean, maybe the word blame isn't really appropriate. Because mm. I think in a way, the idea of proleptic blame is that you don't, you're not, you, re, you know, really, really aren't blaming somebody. Mm. You're saying mm. to them, you've done something wrong, but I'm excusing you from it entirely. Whereas right. uh, <clears throat> I think blame usually would be critical, would be understood to be critical in some kind of way. I mean, I, I would see it as very closely related to anger. Right. You can imagine somebody saying the kind of words that the proleptic blamer would say, uh, sort of suppressing their anger, or at least yeah. it's appearing that they're suppressing their anger in a certain way. And that may be where... Um, where they, they, I agree with you, um, we don't want to bring politicians into it, 
but maybe organizations uh, have a role to play through mm. educating their staff in a sensitive way mm. Like mm. What, what isn't appropriate yes that sounds right um and perhaps there is a sort of i just more i suppose more generally um somehow amplifying the perspectives of people who do notice microaggressions yeah targeted by them um i think this I, I suppose this sort of is linked to um uh the whole issue about standpoint epistemology you know sort of are some people in a better position to perceive certain aspects of reality than the rest of us um and so, you know, that might be one reason for having, uh, you know, sort of ensuring a diverse panel of um, whatever it might be on a job interview where you sort of have uh, as many as many sort of different social, ethnic, cultural groups uh, represented as possible, because you would hope that they each are better at bringing a certain perspective. Um, and perhaps that is, perhaps that sort of is a pointer of, in the right direction here, that um th there's a sense in which saying microaggressions are something that that nobody notices i you know i know regina isn't saying that but i think you know there's there's this sort of perception that it's something you don't notice um which itself uh implicitly assumes that you are from a group that's not targeted by them because you know if you were if you were constantly being asked you know sort of where where are you from um every time you met somebody new then you would notice this and sort of perhaps listen to somebody talking about microaggression and there would be like a, a flick of recognition it's like okay yeah that's that's the name for it <laughs> um yeah. Yeah. but often i suppose you know because uh the the people with the loudest voice the loudest voices are um not from oppressed groups that that's something that doesn't really sort of bubble up into the sort of wider public consciousness yeah, I, I completely take that point about epistemic standpoints. Uh, and it raises the issue about who decides what counts as a microaggression. Mm, mm. I've noticed, um, certainly in the media, uh, and to some extent in the podcast at the beginning, when I, I felt that Dave was slightly playing devil's advocate there, where he said he wanted to ask people where they were. <laughs> really. Right. Um, you know, sometimes people will draw a distinction. They'll say, look... Um, you might be offended by my asking this question. Mm. That's not my problem because it's not an offensive question. Right. The difference between what's offensive and what offends people. And I must say, I'm, I find that um, a dubious distinction, actually. Mm. I think it's just what offends people. And then the question is, uh, should we offend people? Well, no, really. Mm. 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 <laughs> Other things being equal. I mean, there are times when one needs to offend people, but uh, usually one doesn't need to. Right. Yes, that's true. I'm thinking of um, sort of Joel Feinberg's breakdown of sort of when when offensive behaviour is the sort of thing that you know, his. So his his uh, his emphasis is on what the law should do, which I know isn't ours yeah. here. But you know, he sort of points to several factors which help us decide when offensive behavior is something that we should take seriously versus when it it might be an instance of something that you know we all get offended sometimes you just have to brush certain things aside um and he talks about so i'm not sure he has a, a sort of um well he has an analogy between um a single mosquito bite and being kind of bitten by a swarm of mosquitoes and sort of chased by a swarm of mosquitoes <laughs> With the idea that you know if you get bitten by a single mosquito then that might be unpleasant but you know there's no need to make a song and dance about it yeah um but if you're chased by a swarm of mosquitoes then you do then you are entitled to um make a fuss about that especially if there's something that can be done yeah um and so i'm sort of thinking about you know the the person who uh with good intentions is just genuinely interested in um where somebody is from and is sort of thinking well you know so what's wrong why can't i ask this question um they don't know whether they are a single mosquito or part of a swarm right yeah yeah um, 
from the from the uh, from the point of view of the person they're asking, this might be oh god, not an, not another one. <laughs> you know, I've already had to tell answer this question five times today already. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I'd say yeah, you know, I completely agree with that. And it seems, but it's not as it were marking any important metaphysical distinction between what offends and what's offensive. It's more just practical. Mm. You can't you can't. The law is it's you know it's a slightly blunt instrument. Mm, mm. So, I've, for example, I've noticed one story that's been reported recently is, I can't remember which university it was, and I probably wouldn't say even if I could, but some, some university is said to have uh, given st uh, certain students the role of policing uh, the jokes told by mm. other students on the campus. Now, then the question arises, is that a single mosquito or not? I don't think you can mm. say until you until you go there right if there if there if there are lots of uh say unpleasant racist jokes being told then yeah maybe something needs to be done about that right right and it's the people who are likely to be targeted by racism who are the who are the people in the position to say whether this is a swarm versus a a single mosquito right? yeah um, but i suppose it does mean that if if in those particular cases you would need to know more about the context you, mm. you, can't, <clears throat> you can't really decide whether this is something that we want to deal with um, right right procedure or whether you just want to say well you shouldn't really have said that you know well, this this time we'll let you off because it's the only time it's happened in the last 10 years mm, mm. and i'm wondering also if um i mean there's a balance to be struck isn't there between um making sure that the the voices of whatever the oppressed group in question is are heard versus um wanting to make sure that the perspectives they are bringing are reliable because i can um so i'm not talking about sort of distrusting what people say but i'm, I'm i suppose i'm sort of imagining a situation where um a certain type of problem can seem more prevalent than it is perhaps because um because of the role of social media where a couple of instances uh <laughs> on twitter grow to appear as if it's you know as, as if they are sort of hundreds of instances um and you know if it really isn't a hundred instances then perhaps the the kind of scales where you're sort of balancing the okay should we should we prioritize freedom of speech here or should we prioritize sort of safeguarding the the welfare of w whatever the group might be might sort of weigh in favor of freedom of speech or if it's or if it's something that's happened all the time then then it might you know the, the balance might be in the other direction yeah and then I mean, sort of how do you get to that um yeah you're right and there's also a question about how you individuate what you're assessing so mm. i wonder i mean so say you just took a particular kind of microaggression you said oh well, that doesn't happen very often so we'll just forget about it mm. fine but you could see that particular microaggression as part of for example implicit bias in general right. so i think there's an interesting question which they they didn't talk about in the podcast about whether that what microaggression is mm. it's, a kind of, it's in kind, a kind of implicit bias uh, which involves as it were action rather than something like a mission um and it also it also raises the question what the which groups can be subjected to implicit bias and microaggression so i think dave mentioned people with ginger hair mm. but i I mean, I don't know if there are any, if there's any evidence about this. I, I would have thought that people with ginger hair on the whole wouldn't count as a marginalised group mm. uh, in any in any serious way. But I think there is evidence that shorter people do. Mm. Shorter people are um, maybe not marginalised, but they do suffer from being short. They're less likely to get uh, a job, other things being equal. Mm. and should they you know i think many people just are completely unaware of that right um, right in their workplace whether they might be very aware for example of race mm. gender uh height i don't think people are aware uh 
so yeah how far do we extend the boundary of implicit bias and what do we include within it for mm. issues that's a great point and i'm also thinking of um I'm kind of hating myself for this because this is sort of like, well, what about philosophers looking for loopholes? But um, I can sort of think of situations where you might get a marginalised group and it might be um, common for people to respond differently to them in some way, but that approach might be appropriate or, or kind of, a, you know, prima facie appropriate. So something like, you know, suppose that... Um, uh people who use wheelchairs are commonly asked um so suppose that it's a student sort of getting about a, a campus and sort of are commonly asked by their fellow students um are you okay getting to this sort of upstairs lecture room do you need any help um you know if they're sort of thinking you know, i'm not sure there's i'm not sure how accessible it would be so that might be that seems like a sort of um a considerate thing to say but I suppose I, I can also imagine, and you know, I haven't had experience of using a, a wheelchair, so I hope I'm not overstepping the mark. I can also imagine maybe um, a, a wheelchair user feeling a little coddled by that sort of approach, because although it's considerate, it might be a little smothering. Yeah. And so I'm wondering whether something like that would count as a microaggression. I think it could do, and, and mm. whether it does, whether we should count it as one and whether we should take any action would depend on the views of the victims, as it were. Right. Mm, really sorry to interrupt because this is fascinating and the half hours whizzed past, but it's very nearly up to half past. Um, so I just wanted to remind people if they want to ask any questions, um, you're running out of time. So please pop them in the chat or the Q&A and um, we can ask uh, Roger and Rebecca. Otherwise, please do carry on. I guess we're answering everybody's questions as we go. <laughs> covering everything. You're, you're covering all the material. <laughs> I did think one interesting thing that came up at the end of the discussion between Dave and Regina was about um, the, the possible effects of, of philosophy. So Dave was suggesting that, you know, so, you know that Regina's book about microaggressions might just antagonise people. Uh, and make them even more you know people who who know what they're doing might be more inclined to to do it right so this is a sort of you can't say anything these days i'm just going to use whatever <laughs> language i like yeah that's right right, right. Uh, i thought that was a good point and yes let's raise questions about the role of philosophy so i was imagining for example yeah imagine somebody like bill gates get to hit gets to hear about microaggressions Mm. he thinks they're bad and he wants to do something about it and he has the choice you know he might fund some liberal uh philosophical project involving conferences or whatever um or he he might fund the making of some film in which mm. um you know a popular actor is seen criticizing microaggressions <laughs> Right, right. And I, I would assume that actually, if you want to do something about microaggressions, uh, in most cases, taking that practical route would be a better way to go, which does raise questions about practical philosophy. Mm, mm. Yeah, it, it's this is putting me in mind of the, what we discussed before about you know sort of how do we how do you approach this in a way that sort of keeps people on side. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if at some level just people don't like to be made to feel like they're bad people. They don't like to feel like they're sort of going through life trying not to cause any harm. And, you know, somebody says, you know, actually you're doing this, which you know, you're a worse person than you thought you were. Um, you know, some, some philosophically minded people, I guess, are sort of quite open to considering that. Um, but I think not everybody is. And I do sympathise with with people who aren't that it's because it just isn't pleasant to be um, have it have your attention drawn to the fact that you might be hurting people when you're actually trying to go through life not doing anybody any harm. Yeah, that seems right to me. 
I think one possible defense for practical philosophy is to see it as part of philosophy in general. Mm. Uh, I think it's a much, e it's much easier to make the case for, or you know, the humanities, much easier to make the case for the humanities in general than for any particular bit of it. Mm. So, mm. We could say that to both ways, maybe. I really hate to interrupt you again, but we are now over time. Um, I, I can imagine that you could probably carry on discussing this all day, but uh, we probably should draw the session to a close um, and say thank you very much to everybody for joining us today. And obviously thank you so much to Roger and Rebecca for, for their thoughts. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we will be putting a, a recording up on online. So if you have any further thoughts and questions, um, do feel free to get in touch with uh, argufest at philosophy.ox.ac.uk. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks, Roger. Good to see you. Thanks, Rebecca.